Welcome back to Close Up, where it is a great American day because we have with us Senator Lou D'Alessandro of Manchester, who is the author of a new book, Lou D'Alessandro, Lion of the Senate, uh, uh, Thoughts for Presidential Hopefuls. So, Senator, let's talk a little bit about what's in the book. You've spoken on the Senate floor before about losing your mom. I didn't realize it was such a young age for you. Explain, this was a, a formative moment in your life. It certainly was. Uh, my mother left four young boys. My mother was only 32 years old when she passed away. Uh, you know, it was over the Christmas holidays, and uh, all of a sudden my mother was there, and then they took her to the hospital, and she passed away. So it was uh, just an unbelievable occurrence. Who understood <coughs> at that time, <coughs> excuse me, what death was? You know, uh, where was your mother? She was gone, and she wasn't going to come back. I think it was... Uh, it was certainly a moment in our lives and a moment in time that uh, obviously we'll never forget, but we had to go on, and, and we did. Yeah, it's safe to say you had kind of an unsettled childhood moving from uh, family member to family yes. member and then some right. boarding schools. Uh, yes. What role did athletics play in, in really sort of helping you graduate into an adulthood that was successful? Well, I think athletics was the, the linchpin that kept, kept us all together. All of my brothers were involved in athletics. My older brother was a superstar. <clears throat> I did pretty well. My younger brother did pretty well. My other younger brother did pretty well. But it was the one thing that we could all do that, to, that kept us together and allowed us to create associations with, with other, other people. Uh, so it, as I said, was the linchpin, but it, it made it all happen, and it gave you something to do. Take your aggression out, which I think was very important in those days, <laughs> because as time went on, you got mad. Hey, listen, why did my mother die? Right. Why not somebody else, you know? And uh, I, I think it gave us an opportunity to, uh, as I said, get rid of our aggression and to move forward. Right. Uh, we just saw a picture up there, night number 87 for UNH there. I didn't really, you had played at uh, the University of Colorado. Yes. Do you ever wonder, could, do you think you could have made it in professional football? Maybe you've been an, uh, one of those early NFL players back well, in the 50s? Uh, I played at the University of Colorado with Boyd Dalla, Frank Clark, John Wooten, all of whom became NFL stars. Boyd Dalla with the Packers, Clark with the Dallas Cowboys, and John Wooten became an all-pro guard with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, I was a full scholarship athlete at, at Colorado. I got room, board, tuition, books, and fees, and they paid my transportation. But I was a long way from home, and I missed my brothers, uh, I missed my family, and of course, as always, you have a girlfriend <coughs> as, uh, as that goes on. And, uh, <laughs> so I transferred to the University of New Hampshire. But uh, I think I could have had a professional career. My older brother signed with the Patriots initially. I would have signed with the Patriots, uh, Saban, who was the coach at the time. We, he and I were in contact, but I had a knee injury. I had to have a, a surgery, and as a result of that, I was on the shelf. I came back and I played in the Atlanta Coast League with the Providence Steamroller, the Boston Sweepers, and finally with the Lowell Giants, and uh, played with some NFL guys, actually. Bob Tucker, who was all pro with the Giants, played, played with us, and uh, we had a number of, of All-Americans uh, who who just couldn't make the transition but played with us. So, yeah, well, there would have been an opportunity, I think. Right. Now, life takes you in the direction of politics. Yes. You were elected to the New Hampshire House, I think, in 1972. Yes. You end up in the Executive Council. Uh, it's really amazing the encounters you have with uh, prejudice. You've told this yes. story before about uh, what did they say to you when you were first elected to the Executive Council? Well, I think it was the most interesting thing. We talk about racial prejudice. So we're standing in the Hall of Flags, and I've just been elected to the Executive Council. We're there for a picture. So the state historian comes up to me and he said, uh, D'Alessandro, what kind of a name is that? I said, it's an Italian-American name. And he said to me, he looked at me and he said, you know, you're the first non-white that's ever been elected to the executive council. And when I ran for governor, there were those who said the thing that uh, might have made a difference was my name. Uh, because it was a different sounding name and didn't resonate well in New Hampshire at the time. Yeah, and you made the transition from Republican to Democrat, yes. too. Was that evolution, was that something that was natural, or did you, was that something you struggled with in the 1980s? Well, I struggled with it because Walter Peterson was my mentor. Uh, Kim and Zakis, Dave Nixon were all prominent Republicans, but, but they were moderate Republicans. With the advent of Mel Thompson, the party moved very much uh, to the right. And the party abandoned me and, and abandoned my positions. And as a result of that, I met with Walter Peterson. I had this discussion about changing parties. And uh, 
he said, you do what you, do what you have to do. do. Do what's right for you. And it was the right thing for me at the time. Yeah. You write a lot about your role in the first in the nation primary. Yes. Interesting to learn, you say the greatest disappointment you've had in politics was your encounter with John Edwards. Yes. Having uh, endorsed him in 2004 and being there for him in 2008, yep. of course, when things come crashing down, that yep. he let down his family and everyone yep. who supported him. Uh, John Edwards was the biggest disappointment politically in my life because he had the perfect message. There were two Americas. There are two Americas today. And he articulated that message very well. We became, both my wife and I, became very friendly with Elizabeth Edwards. And as I say in my, my, my book, I spoke with Elizabeth Edwards weeks before she passed away. And I said to her, how could you stay with this man who has treated you so shabbily? And she said, he's the father of my children, and he'll have my children after I die. So I, I really don't have any choice. But he had the great message. And had he really been what he said he was, that man would have made a good president because he, he, he had his eye on, on the prize, and the prize was making America better by restoration of equality, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. And then now you write that, you know, you're, you're more conscious now of looking for flaws in these candidates. Yes. We're already uh, starting to see some of these 2020 yes. folks uh, sniff around New Hampshire. Right. Is there anyone you've seen or heard from so far that has impressed you? Well, I've heard from Timmy Ryan, who's a good friend. Tim stayed with us when he was living in New Hampshire and when he was a congressman. <clears throat> I've heard from a couple of, of the senators. Of course, Joe Biden's always been a great friend of mine. Uh, so I think we have a good cast. <clears throat> the question, the question, of course, is: uh, Will the country really be ready? I mean, the country's polarized at this point in time. Does the current occupant of the White House have enough juice to maintain, even though it's a minority? Does he have enough to maintain? And what will happen in 2018 in the midterm elections? I think these are very, very important issues. But we need a change. There's no question in my mind. The people have got to like you and they've got to trust you and they've got to believe in what you're saying, that you really want to make a difference for them and make a difference for the country. You played a crucial role in the wrapping up of this legislative session in terms of that uh, omnibus spending bill. Yes. You were on the negotiating team there. You've got the trust of the majority leader in the other party, who's right. uh, one of the few, if any, political pros there at the State House. Do you think at all, though, about retirement, about make a last term, anything like that? Is that on the horizon? Well, I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope the people decide to keep me. I, I think I want to keep going as long as I can, but I want to make the decision as to when uh, my political career is, is over. Uh, I, I think I'm, I feel robust. My health is good. My family is, supports me. My wife supports me. And I think I'm making a difference. I believe I'm making a difference. And uh, I think you should stay as long as you can do that, but never, uh, never outstay your usefulness. As I say in every speech I make, I always want to leave them wanting more D'Alessandro. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of that, where can people pick up a copy of the book? Well, we'll have a book signing at the uh, Manchester, Manchester Library at 10 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock on the 31st. And it, it, you can get it on Amazon and Mark, Mark but Medanza.com. Medanza yeah. So it's, it's available as we speak. You can get it in the gift shop. At the State House. All right, that's fantastic. <laughs> the book is uh, Lou D'Alessandro, Lion of the New Hampshire Senate, Thoughts for Presidential Hopefuls. Senator, always a pleasure. Thank you. It's Thank a fun you very read. much, Adam. Thank okay. you. Appreciate it. Okay.